Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, thank you for being patient with us. Um, we are so excited to get this evening started with you. Uh, my name is T and I am the Senior Programs Coordinator at AAWW. For accessibility, you can find the captions function at the bottom of your Zoom screen between Q&A and raise hand. And to access our ASL interpreters, they will be um, on screen the whole time, but you can pin them, um, Amber and Jenna, um, and then they will be spotlit the whole time as well. Um, a quick visual description of myself and my space. I am a Chinese, Vietnamese, American, agender person with big round glasses and very short black hair. My top is green and white with flowers um, and no collar. I am speaking to you from the occupied land of the Karnarsi and Munsi Lenape peoples. We thank the past and present stewards of this land on which this programming is based and made possible. For those of you who are new to us, please visit our website, aaww.org, where you can follow us in, uh, on social media and sign up for our newsletter. You'll be the first to know about AAWW programs and opportunities. We're happy to work with Amber and Jenna of Pro Bono ASL for ASL interpretation this evening. We are always grateful to work with the amazing interpreters of Pro Bono ASL. Finally, onto our program. We are all here together in this virtual space to celebrate pride with a standout writer showcase. We're here to make noise, so please don't hold back your enthusiasm in the chat. Tonight's curator and host is a very, very close friend of AAWW. As we are resuming our showcase and open mic series, Mouth to Mouth, later this year, Kay and AAWW will usher in a brand new season in a space Kay has so carefully curated and celebrated. And here, and to introduce Kay, Kay Ulandai Barrett is a poet, essayist, cultural strategist, and A plus napper. They are the winner of the 2022 Foundation for Contemporary Arts Cy Twombly Award for Poetry, a winner of the 2022 Next Book Residency with Tin House, and a recipient of a 2020 James Baldwin Fellowship at McDowell. Their second book, More Than Organs, out by Sibling Rivalry Press, received a 2021 Stonewall Honor Book Award by the American Library Association and is a 2021 Lambda Literary Award finalist. Oh, I'm sorry that you can't see me. Hello, I'm sorry, everybody. Um, well, here I am just in time to introduce Kay. Uh, we have the honor of hearing Kay's work tonight first, and I will let Kay take it away from here. Thank you. Hi, everyone. How are you today? Thank you, Jenna, pro bono ASL. Just an image description. Um, I am a brown, light brown, round queer with clear glasses. I have a lilac uh, velvet hat, a black shirt with white letters, and all the way through it says protect trans kids. And behind me are white doors. So, you know, I just want to celebrate queer liberation and I also want to uplift accessible programs and events for some of us who can't be in in-person, can't party indoors, etc. So thank you everybody for joining us. My first poem is um, titled, The End of the World Means Trans Boys Sprout from Sequence. And it's a new poem. The last time he wore a dress, he felt sequence or snake. Blood of an artery rippled, or was it powered? You could hear the storm of him, bedazzled in sparkles. Did I mention he was 15 and his mom organized the beauty pageant, summoned doctors and engineers from her barangay. 
her blue collar made worthy among them if she just worked harder. He felt their eyes sliver to his confused body. Boy, bested by lipstick. Boy, with flowers. Boy, with crested wings for wavy hair. And to think, what is a petticoat but a gate? A cloud of taffeta, a new orbit. Imagine him then, a dare to be cumulus here for one night. He'll be reckless in the sky. And there, no one is smug or ashamed. They'll think him a queen, but under the dress, he opts for starshine, yes, royal. Instead, a prince whose laugh Juggernauts rolls over in thunderclap. The mist of him barrels over the hotel ballroom draped in white tablecloth. According to the organization's treasurer, whose lipstick glimpsed blackberries, she saw parables of light. Gold boundless beams silked over stage at the sight of his smirk. A parade of high heel drag queens emerged. Garlands of hot pink, of seafoam blue, flounce soliloquies, lip sync to 90s R and B classics. Next, boys with eyeshadow adorned leather, which gilded their riverbed chests. Mm, yes, bantam boys, heaved pages of poems over the chandeliers, stanzas like confetti. How did those toupees transmute to a dervish of kites, glitter enveloped? At this point, a hotel manager has called the police. As a turn of events, the security swiftly intercepted. Dance to the music of high heels, WGN News at nine ushers an anchor who outs herself as trans to say her name like full sugar bite in jubilation. The freedom to name herself to thousands gets rejoiced in the rain. She puts on her favorite wig, no fear. Alarista's crest on the main stage in applause to find flesh, to revel in bashful blush, to know that splendor doesn't have to be tsunami. Instead, dozens of aunties sob tears of relief, kicking off their own pumps, giving the queens a blessed offering. And the dance floor, well, <laughs> that's just an altar. To have been there, is to celebrate the spectacle of breath. The act of knowing the carceral is not everything. In fact, beloveds, we can take it away. Be brazen bouquet. Be new. Thank you. <clears throat> this next poem is called Sick for Sick. And I feel like there aren't queer love poems or even love poems that aren't necessarily romantic, that discuss sickness and chronic illness and disabled people loving each other. So here's my original poem entitled Sick for Sick. Their body patched, swollen skin, hair flex, gone rogue, mismatched knees, ache, knit, quilt throughout. Curvature, a soft, <clears throat> they said, if we hum close, close enough that our chests touch, shared breath comes from belly up, that that, that is not platonic. Now, breathe same air, nostril kinetic by way of brow cleft, pirouette of migraine, syllables twirl temples. Strain is something to lull here, together. When nerves are ablaze, I'm told to be blanket. Lay my torso on theirs, abdomen to abdomen, core to core. Is this what a field does to a hill? 
spill it with poppies. I wait on their skill. How they will sigh. The human body is heating pad. Limbs, bonfire, flip sheets. You can't reverse sick. And today, today we don't want to. Chests pulse soft as lead. Mm. Come spring. <laughs> Come spring, we never do this again. Uh, there's only the memory of it. How their lungs cathedral, how I prayed there on the ledge of inhale, cernum sacred, coughed him, spasm luminescence. Syllables stretched, muscled sacrament more than splay us, petals in overlap, us, an ampersand on fire. Thank you so much. So I have one last poem. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I did that poem because somebody dared me to write about queer love, but also to use the word ampersand. <laughs> nah, okay, last poem. Content warning for mentions of death and mentions of trans death. I read an article as one does when I think of queer liberation. Archaeologists were debating the genders of trans non-binary third gender bodies. And so I wrote a, a post-mortem story or how archaeologists might fail me after Lorival Becerra de Sa, after Lady Cow. And this is my last poem, and I'm so excited for Rika, Chrysanthemum, and Diamond. More than my femurs will be found sprouting below a lilac bush. My left front tooth, a wavy millimeter. My pelvic bone, an avenue in U-turn. Archaeologists might find a body like mine, one like burnt clay pots my cheekbones compressed by loam, my tibia as brittle bow that once kicked up the wind. To argue about bone dust before I'm actually dead, to plot silhouette of my afterlife like video game. Do you think a schematic of a human is only calcium? Do you know trans people recognize more than marrow? Did you know this state or documents could never jot down full plot twists? 80 plus policies introduced in law say trans kids can't play sports, can't mouth truths to doctors. Congress wants badly to get between our legs to dictate a child how to run. What indicates triumph? So obsessed by wonder bred lives to hooray young and forecast the death. Sacrum and tailbone are not some confetti. Trans people on Reddit make psalm on keyboards, uh, obliterate possible pencils from our bones. One said he'd rather swallow flames. His sinew turned soot so archaeologists don't fumble pronouns even after we've become our own blossoms full of blood. I don't blame them <laughs> when I'm dead. Maybe I'll drift out to sea. Uh, my shoulder blade bedazzled with anemone. My collarbone filaments swerved on rising tide by some bashful lovers at sunset. A constellation of quiet carrion nestled in the blushing shimmer of a wave. One will say to the other, huh? Hey, do you see that sky? I made that for you. And by then, we will all know that trans is in everything so continuous. It's silly to wage our wakes at top speed, right? 
Trans people always been interstellar, becoming upturned comets when banished in outpatient psych wards, family reunions, a junior high history book. And of course, this is all speculation. Lament for a future only may be habitable as this hot, hot earth is turned into corporation. Fahrenheit slaughters bird lungs at border walls, deer droughts next to your patrol block. But the concern hundreds of years after I'm long gone is if I'm only a male or female, Let's be honest, you aren't ready for the future. Won't have enough energy to dream up my bones as much as you want it. What's trickling isn't actually my blood just yet. Right now, you can hardly even pronounce the piss of me in the next stall. Thank you so much, AAWW. Thank you, T. Thank you, everyone, and happy queer liberation and trans liberation. Thank you so much, Kay. Oh, sorry. Thank you so much to Kay. Thank you for opening up our night with such a powerful reading. Um, I loved, loved hearing. Um, I always love hearing when um, writers and poets come up with something out of a challenge, like someone dares you to do something. I love it, the audacity of poets. Um, next up is Chrysanthemum Tran, who could not be with us this evening, but joins us via a pre-recorded reading, which I will share um, after the introduction. Chrysanthemum Tran is a Vietnamese American poet, writer, and performance artist. She's the recipient of a McCall Johnson Fellowship from the Rhode Island Foundation and an artist residency at Williams College. A finalist of the Women of the World Poetry Slam, representing her home venue at the Providence Poetry Slam, Chrysanthemum produced and wrote Anthem at the American Repertory Theater's Oberon, profiled by PBS and WBUR. Her writing appears in The Nation, Femme, Bettering American Poetry, The Offing, among others. Her work confronts the historical inconsistencies rooted in the clinical and legal vestiges of empire. Outside of poetry, she moonlights as a queer health researcher and community historian. A quick visual description of Chrysanthemum. In the video, there is pink and orange lighting. Chrysanthemum has long black hair and is wearing a white collared shirt with black and vertical and horizontal lines. She is wearing a red scarf tied to her neck and to Chrysanthemum's left is text with her name Chrysanthemum Tran and her pronouns, which are she, her. All right, everyone, give it up for Chrysanthemum Tran. Just a moment. Hi, everyone. I am a Chrysanthemum. I use she, her pronouns, and I am delighted to be celebrating Pride with you all virtually. Thank you, Kay, for the invitation and including me in this powerhouse lineup with yourself, Diamond, and Rika. Tremendous gratitude to everyone at the Asian American Writers Workshop that is making this possible. Uh, the poems I'm sharing this evening are about relishing in the illegible and the ambiguous, the incorrect and the inaccurate, and maybe even the straight up anachronistic. For a decade, I've been based in Providence, Rhode Island, an area which spans the ancestral homelands of Narragansett and Wampanoag people. Before that, I was born and raised in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, blocks away from the local 39th and Penn neighborhood. This district is on occupied land historically cared for by Kickapoo, Osage, Kiowa, Wichita, and Comanche people. And probably because I watched a lot of Glee as a teenager, I yearned for some metropolitan queer utopia. It wasn't until I was an adult that I recognized for myself how rare it was to grow up by a gayborhood and not know I craved something that was so close. Nearby was the Habana Inn, which once described itself as the uh, Southwest's largest gay resort. 
Uh, shortly after it celebrated its 50th anniversary, the Habano was purchased by developers based in Los Angeles. And now the Habana Inn goes by the district. This poem is called Obad for the Habana Inn. Before reaching adolescence, I drove each morning past the Habana Inn, a degenerate haven hidden plainly off Route 66. On the way to school, my cheeks clenched as I caught in the rear view oblique glimpses of men whose groomed mustaches signal anything but discreet. 39th and Penn was a revolving sleuth of hot rods, leathered pickups cruising out of state license plates. I count from across the street when fetching groceries at what once was Homeland, which once was Safeway, but now is a Goodwill. With a bronze banana split as my alibi, I would track bears frolicking by. I swooned, swore I'd gussy up when I came of age, brace my guts, brave the mountaintops, daddies and sissies alike pilgrimage toward obvious destinations. The village, Boys Town, P Town, WeHo, any Christopher Street, I exhausted all imaginable vulgarities stewing in my backyard just five minutes away. Cowboys, truckers, and pastors, oh my, had I snuck a peek beneath the veil. I'd find nothing but night. Damp, technicolor carpets caked with hot tub swimmers. Drapes finished raw, stained by ultraviolet, ripe for new owners. An L.A. facelift to keep the grit, but strip the must and redevelop. No longer is the Habana. I mourn a little bit each time a retro logo debuts, a thin sans serif makeover. The aluminum sunrise marking the resort, now absent from the highway skyline. Maybe it's better to clean up, dust the bed ruffles, and coronate the pool more regularly. I wouldn't know. I'm still a blue child yearning for first light, staring out the window, ignorant of what I lost from never coming in. Uh, all right. So the next poem is about how fraught pathology is and how mundane it's been for me to compromise part of myself for healthcare. Incidentally, I had a medical appointment today and I learned that for some amount of time I've been recorded in the EHR or the electronic health record as a transgender man, which is maybe kind of like iconic, but yeah, it didn't necessarily have a profound impact on my care, but I do think it demonstrates how absurd uh, getting healthcare often is. Uh, so, this poem is called Alias. All right. Scheduling a follow-up with my PCP, I prepare for disaster. Inevitable as a flood, I hush a moniker kept in confidence. Wager my informed consent for a Hancock to grant passage. Gates are flimsy metaphors. It's more of a worn-down levy. Dyke, ready to burst without notice, answering a call to remind me of the appointment, I am addressed as Sir, despite the EHR. It's fine. Preferred implies suggestion. When convenient, preference is neither mandate nor promise. I opt for prolepsis and bank my surplus meds beneath a mattress. A lesson free from once de facto days of cloak and dagger HRT. Do it yourself. I tithe my trust to a betters and apothecaries who bloodlet with no paper trail, unlike GID. I aim to escape the bestiary. I make no pledge to do no harm. Above all, a diagnosis is billable. 
naming wheels and economy so certain I yearn for recognition, I'd rather not be referred to at all. Like clockwork, he slips my breath despite. Always a he who follows in pursuit of bounty, lucky for him. I'm prone to losing wallets. Milk me clean, leak my pen, enjoy her maiden name. I don't fear loss. If leaving were easy, I'd lose myself more. Sear off thumbprints on a whim just to throw the scent, but neither pseudonym nor sobriquet elude him. He reappears at any corner and border to demand proof I was, am, and will continue to be. Obedience is transactional. I submit myself as evidence, whether I'm canceling my ATM card or disputing the extent to which I exist for social security. I count on coming home, warmly welcomed by debt collections, reminding me to whom I owe my health. Pardon me. My Y chromosome makes a poor fugitive. I went to bed an uncouth boy and woke up lawless. Catch me when you can. I prefer to be waiting. All right. And lastly, uh, this poem is about the pursuit of queer and trans histories, particularly histories of gender outlaws, and particularly those within uh, Asian diasporas. I often think of this pursuit as asymptotic. You know, a lot of close but never really getting there all the way. For example, the Digital Trans Archive. When you search Asian, you get 346 entries. And uh, despite these entries tagged Asian, many of these entries are just yellow face. Oftentimes, trans histories or histories of gender non-conforming individuals or those who have defied social and cultural expectations of gender, especially when uh, viewed from today, I'm often shocked, but not really too shocked by how much yellow face there is. There is a collection of uh, postcards uh, that includes POWs, uh, European POWs, in the very early 20th century. And many of them are often in drag wearing uh, what is uh, supposed to be Japanese costumes, allegedly. My final poem for you all is called About Face. Dusting the trans archive, I search for myself. Today, I'm duped all over the 1900s. Postcards with European return addresses seize my eyes. Never one to expect facsimile. I settle for satire. I'm caught by hundreds of POWs posing in drag. Each photograph depicting the beige of wartime conflict dulls no appetite. Imagination is most of the battle, if not all of the pleasure. Few GIs could resist dinner and a show. Even in conflict, belligerent powers feed their captives. A propos of a theater of war, I picture the khaki fatigues draped across the stage. A field of paint strokes placed carefully on the hand-stitched hemline of an imitation kimono. I clock quaffed curls, the blush blooming behind enemy lines, an audience hankering for the soft kiss of burlap, where silver gelatin suspends just one moment. This collection of winks, plush mercies hushed betwixt bomb and blood, call it anachronism, call it naivety, considering the context, the ladies don't look half bad. I'm wont to question if a captive could savor the cruel spectacle of redress, to self-neuter at will every night. Their faces imply something like a smile. Is it joy, freedom, the thrill of escape? I share doubts about whether femininity serves as effective punishment. I too appear alive at times I'd rather not be. I too am a defect of my nation.
A sick phalanx of heartbeats still running amuck. I am off, escaping today for the pursuit of clarity. A clean answer only the past can provide today. I am found squinting at what appears to be a, an homage to the Mikado. I regret locating myself. A crease of pigment flaking off an Adam's apple. The archaic liability of exposed brick in the archive. I'm a yellowing voyeur eager to identify my likeness where silence sits. Postcards are how a brave man corresponds home. I yearn for the modesty of an envelope, my contents left unseen. To the suspecting eye, an image can implicate a life. Headless torsos grasp the state's face is a covert man's burden. When wagered, visual proof serves to indict. Picture this. A husband returns from overseas as a postcard looming at the mouth of a family mailbox. A wordless threat, silk spun in kitsch. Undeniable is the twinkle captured on film. Moved by a pleasure one found so great, they thought to say, wish you were here. All right. Thank you all so much. Happy Pride. And I hope you take care. And I hope you are all staying safe. A huge thank you to Chrysanthemum Tran, who we terribly missed this evening, but really feel their energy and sharing space with them tonight. Um, we're so grateful to have uh, her words with us, and though we do miss her. Um, next is Rika Aoki, who also could not join us this evening, but will be reading also by pre-recorded video. Rika Aoki is a poet, composer, teacher, and novelist. Her latest novel, Light from Uncommon Stars, was an Alex SCKA and Otherwise Award winner, and was also a finalist for the Hugo, Locus, and Ignite Award. Rika is a two-time Lambda Literary Award finalist for her collection, Seasonal Velocities, and Why Dust Shall Never Settle Upon the Soul. And her first novel, He Mele Ahilo, was called one of the 10 best books set in Hawaii by Book Riot. She has been recognized by California State Senate for extraordinary commitment to the visibility and well-being of transgender people. And her work has appeared or been recognized in publications, including Vogue, Elle, Bustle, Auto Straddle, Pop Sugar, and BuzzFeed, as well as, as the Smithsonian Asian Pacific American Center. She was also honored to work with the American Association of Hiroshima Nagasaki A-bomb survivors, where two of her compositions were adopted as the organization's Songs of Peace. We are so grateful to have Rika's energy with us this evening. And without further ado, here is Rika. We good? Hello, everybody. Um, I'm Rika Aoki, and I wish I could be there with all of you today in even via Zoom live. This is a recording. I am currently uh, at Kundiman teaching there, and so I'm not able to be in two places at once. I want to thank Kay Barrett, though, for letting me come over and share with you and be part of this amazing celebration. Happy Pride, everybody. Happy Pride. So I think that there's something super special about being Asian American and queer all at the same time. I earlier in my uh, in my life and in my world, I had to separate the two. I, I talked about queer things when I was with queer folk and I had to talk about Asian things when I was with Asians. So being able to not be so split and to put everything together and to like just be closer to all of me and what a gift and Asian American Writers Workshop is part of that. And I just wanted to thank you for all the wonderful work that you do. I want to read a little bit from Light from Uncommon Stars right now. And um, this is going to be, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, there's a violinist. Her name is Katrina. She's a uh, mixed race trans uh, 
uh, woman, and she's about to go for her first performance. Her teacher is Shizuka Sotomi, who is a an older violin player who is now a teacher and is also in, has a side business of selling souls to the devil. And Katrina is one of them. In fact, Katrina is her prize right now. But they're preparing for this competition. And I just thought we could share this. Who lives in Temple City? 100 years ago, the answer would have been easy. The area had been opened with railroad money to be settled by German Americans and those comfortable with living with them. 75 years ago, the Camellia Festival was started by the ladies of Temple City to make the community notable, beautiful, and officially incorporated. There had been a Miss Temple City contest, a pancake breakfast with firemen, an active Boy Scout troop, a student art show at the Temple City Library. There had been a cobbler and a hobby shop and a dance studio. Yi Lai Chinese restaurant offered post-war Americans an exotic selection of sweet and sour pork, beef chop suey, and egg foo yum. 50 years ago, kids from Temple City High School would stop at Fisher's Drugstore for a root beer from the soda fountain. While in the park was a pristine white pavilion where local performers played big band, swing, Elvis, Tom Jones. And today, the Boy Scout troop was still there, as was the pancake breakfast, the art show at the library. There was the hobby shop, the bike shop, even the dance studio. The park was still there. Miss Temple City was now Miss Temple City ambassador. The pavilion, now with a fresh coat of paint, still featured the music of big bands and even Engelbert Humperdinck. Yet now, rather than Germans, one was far more likely to find Chinese, Vietnamese, Filipinos, a few Malaysians, and still more Vietnamese. Where there had been shoemakers, coffee shops, and tailors, there were now bridal shops and bova places, a new branch of Golden Deli Pho. And where Yiloi once stood, Agu's kitchen was now busy making stir-fried water spinach, Taiwanese fried noodles, and green onion sesame pie. And although they offered fried rice and hot and sour soup, at least once a week, a staff member would have to inform a confused customer that they no longer served egg foo young. This evening, the park chattered with an uncommon energy. On most summer nights, older people gathered on familiar lawn chairs to hear familiar music. Sometimes they let their hair down to a Beatles tribute band or maybe classic rock if they were really feeling it. But this evening was a classical evening under the stars. The atmosphere felt a little like Hollywood Bowl. Some had even brought picnic fixings from Trader Joe's. And the park was also full of younger, mostly Asian families who were either musicians or the families of musicians. Eventually, the DJ stopped. The festival director said a few words. A representative of the former ladies, now women's club of Temple City gave thanks. And a children's choir led the crowd in singing the Star Spangled Banner. Now, as all this was going on, Shizuka, who I told you about, had sheltered Katrina, who I also told you about, in a quiet space away from across the park near the public library. Katrina was playing sixth, which meant there was no reason to rush. Uh, sh shouldn't we be watching the others? Katrina asked. Astrid will message us when we need to go, so for now, warm up. From across the park, Katrina heard applause. Wow, an applause. Whoever that was must have been amazing. They were all amazing, weren't they? She was playing in a showcase, the classically Camellia music showcase. They were probably brilliant and gorgeous, like anime characters. Katrina, she would never look like that, would she? Wait, classically Camellia music? Her music wasn't classical at all. What if they got mad? What if they stopped her in the middle of Katrina? Miss Satomi, what do you smell? Huh? What, what do you smell? Miss Satomi repeated. Smell, smell. Okay. Katrina took a breath. There was the smell of donuts, the smell of grass, of car exhaust. Some kids over there must be smoking weed. The grass was wet in some places. She could smell the mud, and then she took another breath. With the smells came other senses, the colors, the sounds came back. She could feel the evening cool around her. Miss Satomi squeezed her hands firmly. Now, 
You are going to play in front of these nice people some music, and they're all eager to hear you. You're just sharing your music with the others. That's all. Sharing. Katrina looked at the park, at the people enjoying a summer evening. Some were smiling. Many were peeking at their cell phones, and some were drinking boba. A bunch more were eating donuts. Gradually, her body became hers again. She played through some scales. She repeated a few bars from Shadiak. She thought of the first time she played in front of Miss Satomi in the park with the ducks. Shizuka looked at her phone. She patted Katrina gently. Astrid says, it's time. The MC looked at Katrina and paused. Our next performer is a young violinist. She, I mean, he, I mean, well, who knows these days, right? He laughed awkwardly. The MC's attempts to cover his error only made things worse. The crowd started to Twitter. What did that mean? But she's wearing a dress. A child spoke in Mandarin. Katrina didn't quite understand, but it sounded something like, is that a boy? Shizuka was furious. This was unacceptable. She glared at the organizers, but they were horrified too. None of them had anticipated this. Katrina's face sweat and stung. The pads in her dress seemed to be slipping and she just knew her shoulders stood out under the stage lights. She tried to breathe, but drew back as soon as she felt her belly pushing against the fabric. She glanced off stage. It wasn't that far. She could run off right now and no one would care. Then a loud and clear voice responded over the din. She, she's a girl, you dipshit. It was as if a giant bucket of ice water fell over the crowd. Of course she was a girl. What was that even about? Astrid smiled. Katrina blinked. Ellen Seidel turned in shock to the person who had yelled this because she was sitting next, right next to her. Tommy, shut up. Can we just hear her play? Yes, please, everyone. Please welcome Katrina Wen. The MC finally said, Katrina tried to find friendly faces in the crowd. The ones Miss Satomi said were always there, but to her horror, all she saw was a wall of black. Katrina noticed her predicament immediately. Shizuka noticed as well. Shizuka had forgotten to warn Katrina about the stage lights. You see, spotlight looks great to the audience, right? But when a performer stares into the light, that light is blinding. Instead of the audience, you see a wall of dark. And, and furthermore, everyone in the audience is watching your every move, so there's no way to blink or turn away. Katrina's eyes would eventually adjust, but for now she was on her own. Katrina could hear the audience talking, eating, breathing. So many people, so many people that she couldn't see. What should she do? Her arms were numb. She, her hands felt as though they belonged to someone else, someone far away. The wind blew and something flew in her eye. She flinched. And Astrid, her accompanist, mistook that flinch as the signal to begin. No, wait. Instinctively, Katrina's hands leapt into motion, but the music kept coming. And unlike practice, there was no chance to start this over. Crap, that was supposed to be a down bow. Keep going, keep playing. No, her teeth clenched as she missed another note. Katrina could sense some older people rustling in their seats, probably getting up to leave. She guessed what they were thinking. What is this shit? Who is this freak? Some parents are going to leave too, saving their child's precious classical ears from being corrupted by something as vulgar as gaming music. She felt herself twisting back, a tranny, worthless. She was a dumbass. She remembered the mother, the women on the bus ride, her father kicking down the door, worthless, ugly. And then Katrina remembered, what do you smell? The boxes of donuts, the car exhaust, the kids smoking weed, fresh rosin gently dusting her bowl. The perfume Astrid had lent her wafted off her skin and her hair was beautiful and her shimmering gorgeous dress. And suddenly she was back on stage. Okay, she was on stage and she was in trouble, but she was playing. Katrina relaxed her wrist. Her violin, Aubergine, instantly responded. Okay, good. You still have technique. Her legs steadied. Yes, she had legs. And Aubergine, yes, remember, eggplant? She let herself smile. Gradually, 
her eyes became used to the spotlight. She looked into the park and something glinted at her. There was one face, a, a little boy with glasses, his head propped up on his hands, looking intently. The child was looking at her as if she were an angel. And then she heard, oh shit, she's playing Axiom. A voice in the darkness said, darkness. Katrina recalled all the nights she had spent listening in the dark, but where she had been alone before, now there were others, they, they were listening, they were feeling a friendly face, a supportive glance, whether or not she could see them, Katrina knew they were there. The Boeing was dynamic. Katrina became, the Boeing became dynamic. The string jumps started to fall into place. And suddenly Katrina began to play an axiom. Mathematical and logical concepts were personified as non-player characters. Working with them created the laws of your own universe. And from there, one could build ever more elaborate and involved realities. The music to the game reflected this, developing, curving back on itself, creating new complexities that curved and developed in turn. Thank you for listening. Hope I didn't go too long. And I wish all of you happy pride. And go be happy and beautiful and proud. Take good care of yourself. Uh, it's kind of stupid out there, but be queer, be Asian, and know that you're loved, because I sure as hell love you. Bye, all. That was amazing. I think we all agree. Um, oh, my gosh. Thank you, Rika, for sharing your work and your love. Those words at the end, I feel like I really needed them and they, they held me a bit and I hope that you feel that way too and thank you Rika from afar. Um, so I want to go ahead and hand this back over to Kay um, to introduce Diamonds. Hey, hey everyone. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you for honoring our hybrid approach to programming to be accessible. Please in the chats. Give it up to Amber and Jenna once again from Pro Bono ASL. I'm here to introduce Diamond. So before I read the bio, just let me know Diamond is one of my favorite poets, hands down. When somebody is like, who should I read? I, the first, the first I am is to say Diamond Ford's work. So just FYI. Part of being a curator, the delightful piece is to uplift those who you learn from and those who you think really are just dynamic in your field. So Diamond Ford's debut collection, Mother Body, is the winner of the 2019 Saturnalia Poetry Prize. Ford has received numerous awards and prizes, including a Pink Poetry Prize, a Furious Flower Poetry Prize, and was a finalist for the 2022 Kate Tufts Discovery Award from Claremont Graduate University. Uh, Callaloo, Tin House, and Ruth Lilly, Dorothy Sargent, Rosenberg Fellow, and I read all those applications, so I could tell you um, how dynamic Diamond is. Ford's work has appeared in Poetry, Obsidian, Massachusetts Review, and more. In her spare time, Ford also serves as the interviews editor of Honey Literary and the fiction editor of Nat Brute. Everyone, please give us a round of applause props in the chat and support for the wonderful Diamond Ford. <laughs> I feel so official. That bio makes me always feel so official. Thank you so much. Hello, my name is Diamond Ford. I am a Black femme with short cropped hair, a long sleeve rainbow dress, and floral earrings. I'm sitting in front of a wall full of eclectic posters and art. I want to start off, uh, obviously, by giving my most profound and heartfelt thanks uh, to T, to K, to the Asian American Writers Workshop for their hard work organizing this incredible space. Um, my heart has been just leaping <laughs> this entire time, and I am so grateful. Thank you so much to Rika and Chrysanthemum for their incredible work. I'm shook. Um, thank you so much for Jenna and Amber uh, for their necessary work. So to me, creativity is a queer act. It means living and thriving outside of the margins of definition. It's about possibility. 
And I borrow this line of thinking pretty heavily from Audre Lorde, and anybody who knows me knows that. Um, she wrote in an essay, Age, Race, Class, and Sex, about the possibilities of human difference as a springboard for creative change. So tonight, I chose five poems that I feel align with that idea of queerness, poems that delight in their difference, their bigness, their self-love, their creativity. The first poem that I'm going to read tonight is actually from my debut book, Mother Body, and it's called Stripping. At the zoo, beneath a sky of confetti mist, three elephants pace their own little Africa and Alabama. Beyond the grass coughing its last green, an unseen speaker pumps a steady, sycophantic chant behind Congo drums. Even a Johnny, the only other mammal I've singled out, must know this sound does not belong in the dust beneath his feet. Desperate to unearth this sound, a Johnny grinds his tusk into the naked husk of tree beyond him. Meanwhile, his dick chalks circles in the dirt, a pendulum dependent on red earth. A Johnny grunts forward and phallic in his frenzied bout of bark destruction. How do I tell him they are removing the unnecessaries too? Or that while watching the knotted mass of his back lift to chip, I too broke a Johnny to the small sum of his mating parts, laughing at the absurdity of how quick an elephant can break down to his dick. Would a Johnny laugh too if he knew? Toot a chuckle from his trumpet trunk, then slide so smooth his backside against the tree behind him. Could a Johnny do what I have always been afraid to? Stand erect and bearing the body too whole to be broken. Tell them, go ahead, take exactly what you want. So this next poem um, is part of a new series of projects that I'm doing. Um, and because it's a kind of funky poem, I thought what I'd actually do is I'd drop a link to it in the chat so that you can see visually what's happening. There is a kind of conversation happening in the poem where we have two speakers kind of in, in, in conversation with one another. Um, so this poem is um, actually based on a kind of Barbie-based prompt. Um, when I was a kid, I had a Barbie, like most folks, um, but I was also very destructive. And so one night I realized if you stuck my, if you stuck the Barbie's head on a nightlight, um, it made the Barbie's head glow. Um, and that was great. And so I went to sleep with my Barbie's head glowing on my nightlight. Unfortunately, I almost caused a fire this way. So don't do that. Um, and of course, I, I I woke up in the middle of the night. I'm I'm like, oh my God, there's smoke. Um, <laughs> there's destruction. My parents are in the other room. And I mean, I I grew up in a a pretty mm, let's say strict household, right? Um, and so I didn't let my parents know about these mistakes, right? Um, and I definitely wasn't going to tell my parents that I almost set fire to that house. And so this poem is kind of about that that tension right um that kind of difficulty in parenting uh this is we must break where the speaker fights herself about her smallness and this is uh there's kind of a quote from torn a great house here i learned young to be the smallest target my hips root like wild hogs against my dress I buckle a quiet belt around them, this holding back, a harness meant to tether me to the rash mashed belly of the world. I was raised in the way of field mice, low nose scrounging against any sound shuffled up in the mud, and I felt safest rising like smoke through drawn rooms. I hope to make in me a door that only I can open. There is nothing small about me. 
but I was convinced I had to be smaller, so chiseled at all day at my wrist with a house key to the welts inflamed a field of poppies. I've always been afraid, have always bucked against my unkempt tongue, tired, fought most myself mostly. Stop sobbing, stop sopping globules of snot with your sweatshirt pocket. Go shower, shit, brush your teeth for the love of your God. Fucking eat the landscape of your childhood. It's thousand red umbrellas or beyond pink Barbie. That neon god with a hot guitar, fuchsia dress, vinyl slick against the pink diamond, her bent arm made against her waist, a rock bop. Till you popped her head from her two tan neck, Frankenstein-esque, that parental urge to dismantle what you say is yours. And how many nights did I cradle that Barbie coddling her crimped bangs with drool? And how purposeful my adolescent fingers wiping plays scuff from her plum perfect smile. That I might one day delight in finding beyond pink Barbie's head fit snug on my nightlight. The tapered bulb flexing her jaw into gossamer light. Gruesome but you loved how she cast your room peach hues and went to sleep mesmerized by her eyes turned headlights. Was it reckless if I didn't know fire needs only one small fumbling? When you smelled smoke, Watch, vote to watch it shaking its tresses through the late hour beyond pink Barbie, a torched grin on the wall, heat gnarled, eyes bleached with fluorescent fever. And my parents, still asleep, still unaware of this promised flame coaxing in their kids' room, I learned to swallow fear like a horse pill, to hide evidence, to shun dolls to pray smoke would ghost by morning to tithe obedience to tuck my singed finger behind another when i grabbed a glass to drink to sleep in the dark that i would rather sleep in the dark than admit the fear pooling out my edges spilling rivulets faucets from my ears and arcs wet blaring its hydrant urgency across the carpet stop sobbing stop sopping my family left me a generation of breaking so i must break everything they've given us Ignore my art, it's so excited, it just wants to jump off the walls, I think. Yeah. Um, very excited about the fact that donuts have been showing up. Um, I think I have three poems left for you guys. Um, and this next one is about donuts, right? This is jelly donut or a fat ode for unruliness. Fryer fresh. The yeast dough proofs, balloons in cinnamon heat, batter buttered, harpooned with jam, a red wound blistering my thumb. I want to be this messy, to break the lines, ruling my body, to loosen fat, black, and opulent pools. I sex and ax my gilded nails through a lumbering throat. I crop top too. Coquette, my blubber, my bust, my profile is a perfect parabola. My thighs bred below the hemline of my shorts, and I love them. Deep brown, oiled with sun, sweat, sweetened, wet, hips swollen like berries. When I Jezebel in the marmalade light of a street lamp, drilling through my window, I strip skin, boo hag on the dreamy breath of a dark room. And when I say I love the moon, I meant I've dreamt of tongue punching its gloomy craters, rocked marked curves globuled with spit. And this is the love I give violently, oozing and everywhere. Thank you so much. I have two more poems. Can't write about the ocean without it being about slavery. But what if I want to fuck the ocean? 
How do we scholar circum Atlantic trade and my desire to dip my oyster moist on the saline face of earth? I'm saying I want to straddle the sea with both hips slapping like rafts, unshackle from kelp's clasp wrapping my legs, hell, to dive without needing to net bones from the sea floor and shore. Maybe this is a queer poem. Maybe the ocean is mommy water and I want to tongue her trenches or hold her swells in my palm small shell. Maybe I want to stew in the primordial brew through which life oozes, but do not not read me from the sea slick with afterbirth this isn't baptism or beast not communion nor kink and do not think of ships on the horizons ghosts in their sails instead a consortium of crab scuttling the sea bread or seagrass licking worship from my feet or the California sheep's head, a carnivorous species of fish who isn't afraid to flip a black urchin on its back and see. We both know what I did there. Made metaphor dangerous and recklessly misfit. And this, the thicket of trying to unbramble me in a conceptual sea, see this poem is about my wish to pound the waves and my wet wonder, its ass and ashy knees, my black body, literal and literate and mind anywhere. Thank you so much. This is my final poem. Again, I appreciate this time. I appreciate this space. Amber, thank you so much for your phenomenal work. Okay. This is a fat girl climaxes while working out at the gym. I throw my legs into the stirrups of the hugging elliptical, my knees droplet off the surface of a high hat's crash while Cardi B reminds me of my cardinal needs, a fat sack money bag and a fat stack nigga, a pussy packed sweeter than Saturday, so I keggle cause I gotta have one and why not pussy? Pussy's got character. Pussy would pick up ginger ale for your stomach ache at 3 a.m., then not complain. I want pussy caramel as palm sugar and spices meat. I want my pussy to smell like gardenia. I want my pussy to know I have loved it since the first time I pried its smile into a lazy camera's eye, spied its abundance of pink, the trembling lip of a cock shell or a tulip's dazed and hazy hue. And pussy, you are the only me I've loved regardless. I tend you with a gardener's knotted hands. I work you when my lungs flex and clench their fists because with you, pussy, I'm the baddest bitch, a peacock spider with her fangs and another man's throat, larynx red as a stiletto. I stab blood from every rug I step on and I'm strutting closer to a near explosion of lights. And yes, oh yes, they must be seeing this, illuminated in this cerebral glow, this light shearing flicker more holy than, sorry, this light, this cerebral glow, this flicker more holy than Ina Garten shearing to the TV says, look at me, this light and lyric, this exaltation of Cardi, the good book of Bardier, Bardier, hem, hems, even in my toes, but no, no one notices. The music galore between fat girl and pussy ignored. What to do with this private love but moan some more, pussy. We are loud with an insistence to be. We are a nail bed cupped with cum, a scuffle of air hoping to lung. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diamond. I'm gonna get Kay back on stage as well. Come on, everybody. Come on. Yeah. Give it up for Diamond, please, wrapping us up. Also, again to Amber doing all doing all the work with that text. Thank you so much, Diamond, for being here. We appreciate you so much. Everybody, look at us, Chrysanthemum, Rika, myself, Diamond. Thank you for 
sharing your queer liberation time with us. Thank you, T. Let's all please thank T and the AAWW Union for showing up for queer, trans, non-binary, Black, slash Indigenous, and or non-Black people of color, always first. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. We're going to stay here and simmer. Please do show in the ch chats. I know that the wonderful T had input some stuff about books. So if you want to get Rika's work or Diamond's work, please do. And yeah, thank you everyone for all your time and your spoons and poetry on a Thursday. Thank you for your time, friends. Thank you, Kay. Thank you everyone for being here. Give it up for Kay, our superstar host and curator. We will have so much more of Kay coming up soon with the return of Mouth to Mouth and y'all will know about more, more soon. Sign up for our newsletter and follow us on social media. I really want you to join me in applauding and thanking our dear ASL interpreters, Jenna and Amber. We are always so honored to work with Pro Bono ASL. Um, thank you all for being here. I know we're a little over time, but thank you for hanging out with us on a Thursday. Um, and we love you. We'll see you soon. Thank you. Bye.